UFOs in Krishna consciousness. I may as well start right in by uh, discussing uh, what such a subject could possibly have to do with Krishna consciousness. Uh, so I'll begin uh, by talking about the Vedic picture of reality. What do we read about uh, the layout of the universe and the different populations within the universe in the Vedic literature? Uh, and given the basic description that you find in Vedic literature, uh, what would one expect to find uh, in the modern observable world that might uh, tend to confirm that or disconfirm it or in some way shed light on the, the reality of the basic Vedic world view. So, uh, I'll begin by giving a uh, just brief synopsis of the Vedic description of the universe. Uh, what you have is a universe uh, created by uh, supreme intelligence uh, the, uh, of course, initial creator of this uh, material universe is Lord Brahma, who's manifested from the uh, lotus flower coming from the navel of Garbhadakshai Vishnu. From Brahma, there are emanations of uh, prajapatis, who are uh, beings uh, who are uh, empowered to create other species of life. From the Prajapatis, various generations of species descend. Uh, there are uh, 8,400,000 species of living beings within the universe. All right. There are 8,400,000 uh, species of life you know, within the universe. Uh, and of these, 400,000 are described to be basically human in form. Now, 400,000 species, that's quite a large number, if you think about it. And needless to say, the Vedic literature does not tell us about all of those different species. If you stop to think that, for example, the Srimad Bhagavatam has 18,000 verses. Uh, so if each verse uh, told us a little bit about one of those species, that would only cover 18,000 of them. And there are 400,000. So... Uh, Naturally, we don't have information about all these different species. However, if we look at the Vedic literature, uh, we do have some, some basic information about them that gives us some, some knowledge. Uh, from the Bhagavatam, there are a number of facts that you can glean. Uh, basically, there are the demigods, or devas, whose main dwelling area in the universe is uh, Svarga Loka, uh, these include Indra, Chandra, Varuna, and so forth. It said there are 33 million uh, principal demigods. Uh, there are Upadevas. The Upadevas are almost demigods. They're not quite demigods. Uh, it is said uh, in one Shastra that I noted, uh, one of the Puranas, that the powers of the Upadevas are about three quarters of that of the powers of the, the Devas. So that gives you a sort of numerical idea. Uh, the devas, by the way, have all kinds of mystic powers. This is one of the primary things that you see when you read the, the Bhagavatam. Uh, they have great control over the material elements, and thus it is possible for them to appear and disappear. They can change their form. Indra, if he likes, can appear as a bird, as happened in that uh, pastime with Maharaj Shibi, for example. Uh, they have control over the elements within your body. Uh, they can control your mind. They can manipulate matter in different ways. There are eight basic cities. Uh, these are described in the 11th canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam and a whole series of other uh, subordinate uh, cities or mystic powers, many of which are quite remarkable, and these are fully uh, possessed by the uh, demigods. So the Upadevas typically also possess these powers, uh, to a lesser extent, of course. These include beings such as Siddhas, Charanas, Vidyadharas, 
and uh, so forth. Also, there are Gandharvas, Kinaras. Uh, there are many different categories of uh, Upadevas within the universe. The uh, living places for the Siddhas, Vidyadharas, and so on are described in the Srimad Bhagavatam. Basically, uh, they are beneath the planet Rahu and above the, the Earth. Uh, basically, there is the uh, Rahu uh, planet and between the level of the Rahu planet and the Earth, there are various lokas uh, inhabited by the uh, Vidyadharas, Siddhas, Charanas, and so forth. Uh, beneath them, there are lokas occupied by uh, more demonic uh, grades of beings. Uh, of course, there are three basic modes of nature, goodness, passion, and ignorance. The uh, devas, or demigods, are predominantly in the mode of goodness. Uh, the uh, daityas, demons, are in the modes of passion and ignorance. And there are other beings who are predominantly in the mode of uh, ignorance, which could be called ghostly uh, species of life. Uh, one should make a distinction between ghosts and ghostly species. Uh, a ghost, by definition, is the subtle body of someone who has died, but because of their karmic complications, they are unable to receive another gross body. And furthermore, they are attached to a particular material situation in this world. So they tend to haunt some particular location within this world. Uh, it is said that a person in this situation desires material enjoyment, uh, but they are not granted a material body with which they can obtain these uh, material enjoyments. So it's a condition of great suffering. That's the situation of a ghost. So the ghost is a body of mind, intelligence, and false ego. Typically, the ghosts are not able to do very much. Uh, they may be able to influence a person's mind slightly. And on some occasions, if they can gain access to a person's energy, perhaps because of some physical defect in the person, then they can throw some things around and create disturbances. And these are called hauntings or poltergeist effects and so on. So that's the, the situation of a ghost. But there are also ghostly species. Uh, and there's quite a, a list of them in the Bhagavatam. These consist of Bhutas, Pretas, Tisachas, Yatu Danas, uh, Kush Mandalas, Vetalin. Uh, there are different lists that you find in the Bhagavatam describing uh, these different types of beings. These, however, are species. It's not that when you die uh, and you're just there in your subtle body uh, that you become one of these. Uh, you can also become one of these beings as a result of karma. But they have organized societies, and they are definite species with definite bodily forms. Uh, their bodies are more subtle than the, the bodies we have, but they may contain some admixture of gross elements also. Uh, typically, they also uh, possess different uh, mystic powers. Uh, however, they're not as powerful as the uh, Upadevas. That's also described in uh, different Shastras. So, the fifth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam uh, says that, interestingly enough, these beings have their lokas or dwelling places uh, 100 yojanas above the highest altitude to which the birds can fly. Large birds, it says. So, that would indicate that above more or less the upper region of the uh, troposphere, I guess, uh, in modern terminology, if you go 100 yojanas up, which would be about 800 miles, then according to the fifth canto of the Bhagavatam, that's where you come to the domains in which these beings are living. In addition to that, there are different kinds of living beings that inhabit uh, lower planetary systems. There are seven lower planets, uh, lower planetary systems, which are described in the, the Bhagavatam, mainly in the fifth canto. Uh, these are referred to as subterranean heavenly planets. Uh, 
it's an interesting description. They're called Bila Sparga. Uh, so uh, many different types of living beings live there. Um, many of these are predominantly in the mode of uh, ignorance or they are demonic. Typically when the uh, demons are defeated in battles with the demigods in the heavenly planets, they're driven down into the lower planets like the Tala Loka or Sutala and, and so forth. And then occasionally they try to come back up to the, uh, the heavenly planets. And on other occasions they try to take over the earth. So uh, there are very powerful demonic beings living in the lower planets. Uh, some of them, it turns out, are not demonic, actually. There's the famous case of Bali Maharaj, who, uh, as a demon, conquered the heavenly planets and was uh, divested of his possessions by uh, Vamanadev, the avatar of Lord Vishnu. And in the course of his meeting with Vamanadev, he surrendered to uh, Vamanadev. And so he became a pure devotee. But still... He was considered to be officially a demon and was sent to live in Sutala until the end of uh, this Manvantar period. Uh, at the end of that period, he will become the Indra and then he'll rightfully rule the, the uh, heavenly planets. So apart from that, though, there are beings of lesser stature of many different categories. One interesting group is the Nagas. The Nagas are described as living both in lower planetary systems there we go. And on the earth, uh, the Nagas, as is true of many of these beings, can change uh, shapes. The Nagas typically have a serpent form and a human form, and sometimes a half serpent, half human form. In the story of Kaliya Naga in the Krishna book, of course, Kaliya had a serpent form with many heads, but when his wives were appeasing Krishna, you can see in all the paintings they're shown as being human from the waist up and serpent from the, the waist down. And sometimes the Nagas just are in, in human form. So they have these powers to assume different forms. Uh, it is uh, interesting that the Nagas uh, play a role in the uh, description in Vedic literature similar to that of the so-called uh, fairies in Ireland and uh, Scotland and so forth. Uh, of course, fairy tale is a pejorative term, but there are traditions of beings called uh, uh, Tua de Danan, which means the sons of Dana, uh, who are basically a very aristocratic class of beings of a more subtle nature than, than humans, who were traditionally believed to live uh, in the same lands as England, Ireland, Scotland, and, and in that area. Uh, typically, these beings were worshipped by offering them crops, and they were regarded uh, as being able to control the weather and produce thunderstorms and things like that. So if they weren't given their offerings of the, uh, the harvest, then they might cause a storm and destroy the harvest and things like that. Exactly the same traditions exist in India with regard to the Nagas, especially in Kashmir. Uh, you can read about uh, these different traditions. So these beings are said to live uh, on the earth, the uh, lower uh, planetary systems. So uh, in various uh, Shastras, uh, there's additional uh, information. There's a whole category I've left out. These would be the uh, Pitras, uh, or forefathers, uh, ancestors is another way to look at it. There's the uh, Pitraloka planets. Uh, in some of the Puranas, uh, it is described that there are actually many different categories of Pitraloka planets with many different names. There's an elaborate nomenclature. Uh, so it's a very complex system. Basically, in the Bhagavatam, we just read about Pitraloka. But uh, it's actually described that there are more Pitraloka planets than there are planets of the demigods. And in a way, that makes sense because the Pitraloka planets are connected with the transmigration of souls. And a lot of souls are transmigrating. The demigods are more like cosmic administrators. So, in any case, it's interesting to see that there's a vast array of Pitraloka planets. Some of these are connected with punishment of sinful 
personalities. Yamaraj is presiding uh, in Pitraloka, in the southern part of the universe, and the Naraka Lokas, or hellish planetary systems, are located uh, in that region. So that's a basic uh, rundown on the uh, different uh, planetary systems. So uh, if you look at the Bhagavatam, Mahabharata, and so forth, you find that uh, in the time periods described in those books, uh, many different categories of living beings were interacting very openly with uh, human beings. Uh, demigods would sometimes come to the sacrifices performed by great kings, for example. Uh, when Maharaj Yudhisthira performed the Rajasuya sacrifice, various uh, demigods were present there uh, to uh, participate in various ways in the uh, sacrifice. It was said that sometimes even a common man could see the demigods, which implies, by the way, that sometimes the common man couldn't see them, even though they were actually there to participate. Uh, apart from that, there were meetings and encounters with many kinds of beings of a uh, uh, more demonic nature. There were the Rakshashas. Uh, people would have encounters with these. Uh, there are many stories of the uh, Pandavas, uh, of course, Bhima would occasionally have a knockdown, drag out fight with a Rakshasha, uh, like Hindimba, Hidimba. And he also married the sister of Hindimba. And uh, there was uh, offspring from that named Gatochkacha, which indicated that human beings and Rakshashas could produce fertile uh, offspring. In fact, this is a general concept. Uh, Arjuna was at one time abducted by a uh, Naga woman named Ulupi. Uh, Arjuna was bathing in the Ganges at that time in preparation to engaging in a uh, fire sacrifice at, um, in Haridwar. And this Naga woman came up behind him and pulled him down into the water. But she didn't pull him just into the water. She pulled him down to the uh, Naga Loka uh, kingdom. Uh, her father was one of the kings of the, the Nagas. And in fact, uh, there was offspring from that also. Arjuna had some uh, son from that union. I believe it's described. Of course, demigods would also sometimes uh, produce human offspring. The Pandavas are an example. Each of the Pandavas had as their mother uh, Queen Kunti, and their fathers were different uh, demigods. So, uh, that's a uh, brief description. Uh, I would note, by the way, also that these uh, beings described in Vedic literature are very often said to have remarkable flying machines and called vimanas in Vedic literature. Uh, a very prominent example of the vimanas is the uh, uh, flying machine of uh, Salva. Uh, Salva, by the way, was a human king, but uh, this flying machine was built for him by Maya Donava, who is an inhabitant of the lower planetary system and is a famous technological uh, wizard. So by the, the arrangement of Lord Shiva, Maya Donava constructed this uh, spaceship, or whatever you may call it, for um, uh, Salva. Uh, so... Uh, apart from that, there are many descriptions of Vimanas. Uh, the demigods themselves are even called Vimanaka, which means those who travel in Vimanas. The uh, Upadevas are typically described as having them. Uh, for example, uh, the Vidyadharas, typically they're flying in Vimanas. The Gandharvas also. There's the, some, some of the Vimanas are sort of like single-seater uh, vehicles, it seems. For example, one Gandharva was flying over the palace of Devahuti, and he saw Devahuti playing ball on the roof of the palace, and he fell out of his vimana. He was so uh, infatuated with Devahuti, so it seems as though maybe he banked too steeply and he didn't have his seat belts on. So, uh, on the other hand, uh, the, the Vimana of Salva was huge. He had armies on board his Vimana, 
and he was dropping all kinds of things on Dwarka. It's interesting, by the way, that he was not dropping bombs like in World War II. He was dropping slabs of rock, tree trunks, poisonous serpents, and so on. So it seems he didn't have a, a, a technology for bombing. So this was entirely an amateur operation. Uh, he just happened to get this uh, flying machine from somebody else who knew how to build them. But in his own human society, people didn't know how to build those things, evidently. Uh, or they would have had the technology that, that goes with it for bombing and so forth. So, uh, also there are descriptions of flying cities in the Vedic literature. There's the city of Hiranyapura, for example. Uh, Hiranyapura was occupied by uh, different groups of Donavas, such as the Puloma and Kalakeya Donavas. And they would just travel around the universe in their flying city doing whatever they wanted. And they had a benediction from Lord Brahma that no demigod could defeat them. So, uh, however, they did not have a benediction that no human could defeat them. Because after all, humans are actually quite uh, puny and insignificant. So, an arrangement was made by Indra for Arjuna to uh, attack uh, Hiranyapura. Uh, because, of course, he was technically a human, although he wasn't uh, exactly human in his powers. And so Arjuna destroyed Hiran Hiranyapura with celestial weapons. So this is the, the basic... Uh, so if this is true, one can ask, well, what about the world as we experience it today? Now, today, the, the standard view of the world which people are raised on, is that basically uh, human beings are the only intelligent form of life which exists uh, within the range of our senses. Uh, scientists will argue that all of the planets in the solar system are uninhabited except for the Earth. Life cannot exist there. Uh, they speculate that if life could evolve on the Earth, then maybe it could evolve on some other planet, on some other star, but the probabilities are that this would be very, very far away from the Earth. And many prominent scientists, such as Carl Sagan, for example, have argued that interstellar space travel is not at all a practical consideration. There are limitations imposed by the speed of life and the theory of relativity and so forth. So practically speaking, we are alone in the universe as far as intelligent life is concerned. Uh, so... In contrast, the Vedic literature describes all these different forms of life, many of which live on the earth or beneath the earth in a subterranean region or very uh, close to the earth, uh, a few hundred miles up above the earth's atmosphere and so forth. So one natural question that you can ask is, well, if that is so, where are they? Now, this, of course, is the Kali Yuga. It's uh, different from the Dwarpara Yuga. It's described that the demigods do not uh, manifest themselves uh, before human beings here on the earth anymore during the Kali Yuga because proper sacrifices uh, for the demigods are not being performed. So they won't appear here. Uh, they still live here. Uh, Lord Chaitanya, for example, uh, met Lord Shiva on uh, Sri Shaila Hill in South India, that's described in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, and various other demigods were also living there, as described uh, there. So, but they don't make themselves visible normally to, to human beings in this day and age. At least that's not the, the standard procedure. But there are many other uh, categories of living beings, and there is no account indicating that uh, they have uh, cease to uh, become be manifest or to live on the on the earth. Uh, in particular, there are beings in the mode of ignorance and and so on and so forth. So, uh, one uh, prediction one could make based on the uh, material in the Bhagavatam is that it would seem that there should be some interaction between human beings and some other form of human-like intelligent beings but you wouldn't expect these, generally speaking, to be demigods or anything like that. That would be something you would expect 
based on the, uh, the Vedic literature. Now, uh, Srila Prabhupada has not said very much about this kind of possibility. Uh, he has said something, though. One comment that Srila Prabhupada made, I think this devotee Madhu Visa was asking Srila Prabhupada about UFOs and so forth. So he said in a letter to him, uh, your second question about spacemen from other planets it is stated in the Vedic literature that there are many planets where the inhabitants are more advanced than the inhabitants of this Earth planet. So it is not unlikely that such people may have developed space traveling methods. They occupy higher posts in the creation of the Lord, and so they may be considered as demigods in the same way as the President is especially empowered by the nation. But this does not mean that such uh, spacemen are necessarily carrying the messages of the Lord just as the business of the state employees is not to act as the state representative, but he acts in his particular job. So that's uh, an interesting uh, statement. So all Srila Prabhupada is saying there is that uh, such things are possible. It is not unlikely that such people may have developed space traveling methods. But there's the interesting point that, that he makes that this does not mean that such spacemen are necessarily carrying messages of the Lord. That could be uh, highly relevant. So, uh, now that is the introduction concerning the, the Vedic worldview. So, what I'll refer to now is the, uh, the topic of UFO phenomenon. Uh, say a few words briefly about that and then relate the, the, the two topics to one another. Uh, the, the basic um, a theme of the, uh, with regard to the UFO phenomenon, is that people since the late 1940s have been uh, reporting uh, some kind of beings uh, traveling about in the atmosphere of the Earth with some kind of unusual vehicles. Uh, and people report meeting these beings and having different kinds of encounters with them, and so forth. Uh, a number of interesting points can be made. Uh, first of all, this is considered to be a very uh, disreputable topic in uh, many circles. And there are reasons for that. Uh, I can go into a number of the, the reasons. Uh, part of the reasons have to do with uh, the uneasiness that is produced in people of the uh, modern outlook on life at the thought that some other kind of beings may exist which could be uh, equal to ourselves or superior to ourselves in intelligence and in power to manipulate the material energy. Uh, such beings pose a threat, naturally. Uh, lower animals that are less intelligent than ourselves naturally do not pose any particular threat. But if someone is of equal or greater intelligence, then they could create problems. So, there is a tendency to, uh, for the idea that such beings may exist to create uneasiness. Part of the history of the UFO phenomenon is that there have been interactions between people in the military and uh, different uh, beings flying around in unusual vehicles. Uh, there's a, a very extensive history involved with this. Uh, once again, just to sum up the, the gist of it, the indication is that for many years, uh, people in the military have had encounters with flying machines that complete, can completely outperform their own military airplanes. And this, of course, would create considerable concern among the military. Uh, Many sources indicate that the government, for example, in the United States and in various other countries around the world, uh, is concerned that if people were to become well aware of the reality of this kind of uh, activity, then this could destabilize uh, government uh, and social order. Uh, people might panic. There could be different... Uh, breakdowns in society, they might rebel against the government, and so on and so forth. 
there's a great deal of documentation relating to this idea. So there have been specific programs to uh, debunk or ridicule the UFO phenomenon so as to prevent people from uh, widely coming to this kind of uh, conclusion. Uh, for example, in 1953, there was a panel of uh, scientists headed by a man named uh, Robertson, who is a uh, very famous scientist dealing with the theory of relativity. Uh, the panel was con uh, convened by the uh, CIA, and the, uh, it met for three days, and it came out with a, um, uh, a paper which was kept classified for many years, but maybe about 20 years ago that was declassified, saying that, uh, indeed, this UFO phenomenon should be debunked systematically uh, by making, making use of the media, different kinds of movies, TV pre presentations, and so forth, in which the idea was essentially uh, ridiculed. So uh, this kind of background is there. I won't go into that in much more detail. Uh, I will mention that uh, quite credible witnesses have given testimony uh, concerning uh, relations between the U.S. military and uh, the UFO phenomenon. Uh, for example, I myself have spoken to a uh, man named Elmer Green, who's a uh, Ph.D. He's working for the Menninger Foundation doing medical research. That's in Topeka, Kansas. And in the early 1950s, he was engaged, he was the head of a group of engineers in the military doing metric photography for weapons tests. Uh, in metric photography, you have cameras which you can use to track missiles and other kinds of weapons as they fly through the air. This is used for testing the, the weapons. So his experience was that members of his group were obtaining pictures of UFOs along with the, the weapons. Uh, a UFO would follow, let's say, a missile. Uh, just to give you one example uh, that he described to me, once they were going to fire uh, a V-2 rocket. Uh, back in those days, they were still testing the V-2 rockets that they'd captured from the Germans. So... Uh, their cameras were ready and the rocket was about to fire when two small disc-like objects came down from the sky and went revolving around the rocket for about ten minutes or so and then went flying off into the sky. And he said they used up all their film uh, on the objects so then they had to delay firing the rocket while they reloaded their uh, cameras with more film. Uh, so there were many descriptions like this. Uh, he personally saw a UFO flying after a cargo plane that was coming in for a landing. This was in uh, China Lake at the uh, Naval uh, Weapons Testing Center there and so forth. So he described this to me in great detail. He said that the reports and all the photographs of these uh, objects were duly uh, forwarded to Washington. And he said that uh, when uh, some of his colleagues asked later if they could see the reports or refer to them. They were informed that there are no such reports. They were simply told, well, we have no record of, of such a report. Uh, there was never such a report. And it was simply left at that. So this was the, the experience that uh, he was having. And there's extensive documentation along these lines. So this is some of the, the background uh, on the uh, UFO phenomenon. Now, what I would like to do is uh, go fairly quickly to the point uh, to uh, describe uh, how the UFO phenomenon relates to Krishna consciousness. Uh, this is entirely a matter of uh, preaching of Krishna consciousness. Uh, at the present time, a very large amount of material has accumulated concerning encounters that people have with UFOs and different kinds of beings associated with them. The beings typically are of two broad categories. There are beings who are, to put it bluntly, they appear to be very Thomasic in nature. 
uh, very uh, frightening. Uh, and there's another category of beings that seems to be more in the mode of goodness in terms of their behavior and their appearance. The frightening beings typically look totally horrifying. They come at night. Uh, they uh, cause people to become paralyzed. And uh, there's a whole experience that people describe in relation with these beings. There's been a lot of publicity about this lately, and this is called abduction. Uh, they will say that they are carried away uh, into perhaps the UFO, at least into some room somewhere, they don't know where, uh, and subjected to various uh, types of mistreatment that sort of look like a medical examination, but they're very painful and uh, they involve quite a number of very unpleasant uh, activities. Uh, these people typically become uh, traumatized by the, the experience. Uh, in recent years, quite a number of people in the medical profession have begun to investigate uh, these reports. Particularly psychiatrists and psychologists have made these investigations. They have found, typically, that the people are not psychotic. Uh, they typically exhibit signs of what is called post-traumatic stress syndrome, which is a psychological syndrome that develops as a result of traumatic experiences, such as rape or, uh, say, Vietnam veterans sometimes have this kind of syndrome and so forth. So basically speaking, uh, just to give you an example of some of the psychological studies, uh, a blind experiment was done with one psychologist named Elizabeth Slater, uh, and uh, I think it was six different people who had reported being abducted by these beings. Uh, Elizabeth Slater was not told that that was in fact what these people had in common. Nothing about UFO abductions was mentioned to her. She was merely asked to give a psychological evaluation of these people. Uh, she performed the evaluation, concluded that they were all perfectly sane. Uh, these were people, by the way, in a number of walks of life. One was a uh, New York corporate lawyer, for example, a woman, career woman. Uh, another was a secretary. Uh, one was an artist. I think someone was an engineer. A um, variety of different backgrounds. Uh, these were all very respectable people. Uh, they were not nutty in any way. They did not have unusual occult interests. Uh, they were quite run-of-the-mill, actually. Uh, and they were certified by her to be perfectly sane, but she observed this uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome type uh, manifestation in them. Uh, when she was informed that what they had in common was that they had been carried off by strange little men and subjected to tortures of different kinds, she was totally shocked. And she said that, according to her previous training and understanding of psychology, uh, people who would tell stories like that would have to be uh, strange psychotic uh, characters given to fugue states and uh, schizoid uh, experiences. So, uh, this is one example of the studies. Uh, recently, there's a uh, professor of psychiatry at Harvard University named uh, John Mack, who is taking these experiences very seriously. So, these are experiences in which people claim to meet a kind of being which is, uh, as I say, frightening in both in appearance and behavior. These beings typically exhibit what would appear to be the equivalent of different uh, mystic cities described in Vedic literature. Uh, for example, there's a mystic city called Vasita City, which is described in the Vedic literature. It is a power of hypnosis by which one can control the mind of someone else at a distance. Srila Prabhupada commented that sometimes a yogi acquires a small degree of this Vasita City power and he comes among the people uh, convinces them of some unreal thing, takes away their money, and then leaves. Uh, so, uh, the uh, beings who engage in these activities appear to exhibit a power like that. 
they can control the minds and bodies of the, uh, the people who are uh, having these experiences. Uh, another feature is the uh, Lagima City. That is the power to nullify gravity. Uh, and these beings are very frequently described as floating through the air. Uh, so sometimes when they take people with them, they cause them to float through the air also. Uh, there are many accounts like this, uh, and many quite responsible people have, uh, have given testimony to this effect. I'll just mention, for example, there was one uh, uh, Air Force officer named Moody. I forget his first name now. But he was uh, a member of an elite uh, force in which very careful psychological screening was used to eliminate any kind of unstable uh, personality uh, from, the, from that military group. Uh, he had an experience of an encounter with these kinds of beings, and he made the comment at one point that, I hope nobody sends for a uh, straitjacket for me, but those beings did not walk, they floated. That was his description. He saw them floating across the ground coming towards him. Uh, there are literally hundreds of accounts of, of this nature. So that corresponds, though, to a uh, mystic power described in Vedic literature, which is the um, Lagima city. Uh, it gets worse than this, however. Uh, these beings are described to come through walls. Now, this is where one begins to think of ghosts and things like that. Something insubstantial that can come through a, a wall. But uh, that is also described in these accounts. It's a very standard uh, description. Uh, there is, by the way, uh, just to give another uh, reference for credibility, there's a history professor named uh, J David Jacobs at uh, Temple University in Philadelphia who has written a book called Secret Life. Uh, he studied a large number of these cases. And he, by the way, is pretty much of a materialist uh, in his views. He makes that very clear in his account. Uh, it's, by the way, respectable to be a materialist, especially in a, a university these days. Uh, so he's a respectable man. And uh, he affirms that these beings tend to come through the walls. And since he definitely does not believe in mystic powers or any kind of superstitious nonsense like that, he says that, well, they must have some kind of technology by which they can alter the molecular structure of the wall and somehow pass through it. It's just a very advanced technology. After all, uh, just think to a... a savage tribesmen, uh, radio and television and airplanes would seem magical. So likewise, these things seem magical to us. That is the way he reconciles himself to these things. Uh, it is interesting, though, that these correspond to Vedic uh, cities also. Uh, in the Krishna book, for example, we have the story of uh, uh, the abduction of Aniruddha. Uh, the story, of course, there is that uh, Usha... Uh, of course, dreamed of this beautiful young man. Usha was a very protected princess. She was in the castle of Banasura, and uh, there were no easy ways in there to get at, to get at her. Uh, so, uh, but Chitraleka, her mystic yogini girlfriend, uh, traveled through the ether. Srila Prabhupada, whenever he refers to this, he calls it traveling in outer space. Uh, but the space in question is the ether. And actually, the ether is everywhere right here. It's not that it's just way out beyond the atmosphere. So, Chitraleka could travel uh, through the ether or through outer space, which as far as I can understand it from the different descriptions in the Vedic literature, means that ordinary matter would cease to be an obstacle and she would just be going through the space. It's as though you can ignore everything that's in the space and just go through space to another place, which means you could travel through walls, trees, or whatever was in the way. Uh, at the other place, you come back into the normal state of existence and it appears that you've passed through matter. So she picked up Aniruddha without waking him up 
and took him back uh, into the uh, palace, into the quarters of uh, Usha. And then, of course, they uh, had an affair there, which was very disturbing, ultimately, for Banasura, uh, the uh, Usha's father, when he found out about it. So uh, that's an example of this kind of uh, mystic power in the Vedic literature. It is possible also in Vedic literature to go through walls and, and so forth. Uh, interestingly enough, in the uh, 11th canto of the Bhagavatam, there's a description of a mystic power called Mano Java. Uh, Krishna is describing the different mystic cities to Uddhava. And he says Mano Java is the power whereby the body is made to follow the wind that accompanies the mind. So, uh, that's an interesting idea. According to that, if you move your mind somewhere, Srila Prabhupada has spoken of traveling at the speed of the mind, with this mystic power, you, your body will move with it, and your body will go wh wh to whatever place you visualized in your mind. So, uh, these uh, reports of these beings involve uh, these kind of uh, mystic uh, powers. So there's a, a strong analogy that can be drawn uh, with the uh, powers exhibited by these beings and the powers described in Vedic literature. Furthermore, the beings seem to fall in a sort of ghostly category, just based on the descriptions people give of them. Uh, and in the Vedic literature, you have the different categories of ghostly uh, beings. As I say, these are not ghosts, but they are uh, beings of a ghostly nature that tend to be predominated by tamagun. Uh, these, by the way, are described in great detail in the Vedic literatures that relate to Lord Shiva. This makes sense, because Lord Shiva is Bhutanath, so he is specifically concerned with those beings. For example, in the Vayu Purana, 18 different kinds of Bhutas are described and their bodily forms are described. They have a great variety of different bodily forms. And then uh, 16 categories of pisachas are described with all the details of their bodily appearance. So, uh, still that's a long way to go to get all 400,000 uh, types of species. So, the uh, basic idea then, uh, with regard to this UFO phenomenon in the Vedic literature, is that this can be used for preaching Krishna consciousness. Uh, a lot of people now are taking these phenomena seriously. Uh, many books have been written on the subject. Uh, at the present time, there are all kinds of TV specials dealing with this subject matter. Uh, as I say, uh, professional people like psychi psychiatrists and so on are involving themselves with it. Uh, so, the uh, uh, interest is there. And one can take this material, compare it with the material in the Vedic literature, talk about the Vedic picture of reality, and say that uh, this basically confirms the Vedic picture of reality. And it provides a forum then for talking about the Vedic picture of reality as something real. Uh, apart from that, one can just say, well, on faith, one should accept that these uh, things are true, uh, but it really becomes a matter of a leap of faith. One lives in the, the world of modern experience in which we are the only intelligent beings that we know of uh, on the planet or within many, many light years of here. So one can consider on the basis of faith that, well, maybe the universe really is, or at least maybe at some time was, as described in the Vedic literature, but the advantage of this subject matter is that in discussing it, uh, one can then discuss the, the Vedic picture of reality as something actually real. Uh, it's perfectly natural then to do that. And on that platform then, one can talk about all kinds of things uh, relating to Krishna consciousness. Now, one feature of this whole UFO phenomenon is that people who look into this at all seriously find it to be very disturbing, as you might imagine. Uh, I've described the, the Thomasic aspect. Uh, there are other kinds of encounters that are not so frightening. 
I'll get to those in a moment because there's an interesting thing we can say about those as well. But if we look at those that are considered to be very Thomistic, these are very disturbing. Uh, this David Jacobs, for example, said, sometimes somebody will ask me, what if this all turns out to be an illusion? And none of these things are real. It's just some kind of a dream or an illusion or something like that. And he said that if that turned out to be the case, I would weep for joy. You know, I don't want this to be true. This is what he was saying. So, uh, the Vedic literature provides the actual solution to this kind of problem. Uh, for example, and the solution, of course, is Krishna consciousness. Uh, the simple, basic logic of it is this. If we think that we are the only intelligent beings within many, many millions of light years, and we think that we have the power to control nature, then to solve our problems, one natural way to do it is to use our own intelligence, uh, learn how to manipulate matter in a more ingenious way, and thus deal with the different difficulties. We can conquer disease, we can solve the problems imposed by nature, uh, and so forth, using technology and science, and in this way, deal with everything. And if we are the only intelligent beings around, how else could we do it? But if there's the possibility that there are beings superior to us that might in fact mistreat us in some way, for example, then what can we do? We can't fight them if they're superior to us any more than, say, members of a savage tribe could uh, fight off uh, people with modern military weapons. Uh, just consider the plight of, you know, some tribesmen when they meet up with a modern army. What can they do? So. Uh, the solution then is simple. Uh, you have to appeal to some higher beings. If some beings higher than you are causing you trouble, then the only thing you could possibly do is appeal to somebody higher than them. Logically speaking, you may as well go straight to the top. Uh, I mean, one uh, thing you can immediately infer from the existence, by the way, of beings other than uh, humans is that there must be God. Uh, it's a natural inference. If we are, in fact, the only intelligent being uh, on the Earth, then you can perhaps give some credence to the evolutionary theory that we came up from the apes. You know, things have been gradually improving over millions and millions of years, and we're just the pinnacle of the evolutionary process. Uh, we're the best thing that's come along. So that makes sense in that picture. But if you have all kinds of beings superior to us, immediately the evolutionary view breaks down. First of all, the theory of evolution in no way can account for any of the types of beings that I've described if, in fact, these are real. Now, by the way, as a point of epistemology, I don't insist that any of these things are real. Uh, it's perfectly all right for me if this is a species of folklore that has now emerged within modern consciousness for some sociological or psychological reason. That's perfectly all right. But a lot of people are taking it seriously, and Vedic literature says that such beings are real. Whether people are actually experiencing that now or not is another thing, but certainly they're reporting experiences which enable you to talk about this subject matter in a very serious way. And that's the basic point. In other words, we don't have to affirm that any of these things are real in order to talk about these things. Uh, in this book that I wrote, in the introduction, I said, in fact, I gave the advice that for some people, the best way to look at this is a study of folklore. Uh, so, and I'm not saying, by the way, that therefore it is just folklore. Uh, this is just a point of epistemology. What we're mainly interested in getting at here is the, the Vedic literature and of bringing that into serious discussion among people. So, uh, to cut a long story short, the solution to the problem posed by being superior to us is you have to surrender to God. Uh, if there are beings superior to us, that suggests that the theory of evolution is certainly uh, not very good. Darwin's theory cannot explain the origin of such beings. If you try and stretch Darwin's theory to accommodate them, then you've got real problems. Uh, 
if you say they evolved on another planet, then the problem is why do they look similar to, to humans? Because they do. They have two arms, two legs, head, eyes, and on, in the right place, and so on and so forth. On the other hand, if they evolved on the Earth, where's the record of that? Uh, there's no record.